so tonight, what we're looking at, as you can see by your notes here, is Gog and Magog. There is a place in the book of Revelation where it names Gog and Magog, but more than that, um, there's probably a place in the book of Revelation where we might see some Gog and Magog evidence, if not the all-out war. Um, so I thought it'd be a good idea to look at it, see what it is, and see what it's not. Real quick, if you have your Bibles, flip to Revelation 20, and we'll see where it comes in. Starting in verse 1, he says, uh, Then I saw another, uh, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the setting is, this is after the Great Tribulation, that seven year period, we're going into the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. And then John writes in verse four, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witnesses to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, first resurrection it has to do with it's kind of a, uh, a category. It's not... We know that it's not the absolute first resurrection that ever happened because for one thing, Jesus resurrected, right? And it was well before this. So there's a category of a first resurrection and a second resurrection. But that's another story for another time. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be getting into that eventually. But so what happens is, we'll jump down real quick to verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, at the very end of the millennium, in other words, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together uh, to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and they surrounded the camp of the saints and the <laughs> beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it's kind of an interesting thing because we see Gog and Magog, and where's the other chapter that's really famous where we see Gog and Magog? Where else in the Bible? Come on, you know this. What's that now? In the Old Testament? Yep. Ezekiel 38, 38 and 39, actually. Two big chapters there about God and God. And actually, you'll first see God back in Genesis chapter 10. And um, it's mentioned there, it's a, it's a region north of the Black and the Caspian Seas. Um, what I want you to look at when we, when we take a look at this is we just read through this. You, you can put your finger there or bookmark it or go back and visit it again. But what, after reading this, I want us to look at Ezekiel 38 and see if it's the same thing as this. What you think. Some people think it is. Um, another perspective is that um, the battle of, or the war of God and the God is the same thing as Armageddon. Some people will have that view as well. So we'll take a look at all these and see if you think that it's possible that they are the same or if they are different and why either way. Um, there are a couple of charts there that we will refer to, but we don't have to do it right at this moment. We'll get to it. 
<coughs> Ezekiel 38. Now what's just happened in Ezekiel, the lead up to this, is before Ezekiel 38 was Ezekiel 36 and 37, which is yeah. not surprising, is it? Okay, but seriously, what Ezekiel 36 and 37 are is, um, you remember that song about Ezekiel and his dry bones and the foot bones connected to the ankle bone and all that? And uh, Ezekiel is set out in this dry desert and said, can these bones be made to live? And the whole story, when you read those chapters, is about Israel becoming a nation again. It's dry land, it's desert, it's barren. And Ezekiel witnesses this vision that's showing him how that the land is fleshing out again. And then plants come back and everything else comes back. So Israel becomes a nation again. And then after Israel becomes a nation again, we got Ezekiel chapter 38, which is the next big event that happens, which is the Gog and Magog War. It's the next big event in the book of Ezekiel, anyway. Okay, so we have that going on. So we've got Israel becomes a nation, and it was a desert. And then we've got Gog and Magog battle going on. So now, did we see Ezekiel 36 and 37 yet? Ezekiel 30, is Israel become a nation? Is the land become a place? It has. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jesus kind of mentioned that too. On the, on the Mount of Olives, in Matthew 24 and so forth, reading on the Mount of Olives, and he's talking about the fig tree prophecy. And when you see the fig tree, and, and I think it, and Luke also says the fig trees and all the trees, and you see them bloom again, um, then he says basically, Luke, Luke will say, uh, look up for your redemption draws in there. Um, Jesus talks about how the end is, is imminent at that point, that the generation that sees all these things that he mentions in the Olivet Discourse, he says, that generation will not pass away before we see the coming of the Son of Man. So, you got kind of a... Let me, let me get one of these things here. I bought my own markers just because I saw Greg struggling last week. Um, so, we've got this kind of timeline here. May... 1948, Israel was finally and officially recognized by the United Nations as their own nation. Since then, they grew and they have, it has become fully in bloom and they're getting attacked on all sides, right? So we've got Israel become a nation. And then somewhere along the line, you are here. Uh, this right here, generation, which is a big question mark, how long a generation is. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the generation that sees this and all the other events come about, sees the beginning of these things, will not pass away before we see second coming. Because he wasn't talking about the rapture at that point. She could take seven years off that. And so we have this big question mark here. So we don't know how long that generation is. People do the funny math all the time. And they'll find places in the Bible where it says, well, a generation is 40 years. Well, over here, a generation is 70 years. Over here, a generation is 90 years. Well, what I, I try to keep in mind, it, it's a principle that... Um, it's something I kind of came up with is, um, if I can put it this way, Methuselah. Methuselah. It's sound like you know who over here. I know. The Methuselah principle. <laughs> Not naming any names, right? Now, I, I'm going to tie all this all together, but who, now who's Methuselah? Remember Methuselah? What do we know about? Man. Oldest man ever, right? He was right before the flood. Methuselah was right before the flood. And his name, very loosely translated from the Hebrew, means basically, when he's gone, it comes. And the promise was, 
After Methuselah died, judgment on the earth. And true to form, after Methuselah died, judgment came. To me, the Methuselah principle is that uh, a generation doesn't have to be 40 years or 70 years or 90 years. It's, you know, when Methuselah dies, whenever the Lord, the Lord by his grace, this is a picture of God's grace. He told the people on the earth that when this guy dies, judgment. He made this guy the longest living guy. That's God's mercy and his grace. Now, I don't know if there's a Methuselah, one guy out there today, or one lady, or whatever, but I'm just saying, a generation is as long as first person, somebody born, and saw these events in 1948 to whenever. But we know we're in that final generation now. And how long that goes, it's hard to tell. But if you're alert at all of what's going on in the world today, especially have one eye on Jerusalem, you know we're so close. We are so close. So anyway... That's all to say that Ezekiel 36 and 37 are here, and Gog and Magog are mentioned in, in Revelation, but they're mentioned way at the end of the millennium. Well, but then after Ezekiel 38 and 39, the whole rest of the book of Ezekiel is about the millennial temple. This massive, huge thing that, I mean, here's Solomon's temple, you know, and the millennial temple way it's described is way larger. It's huge. It is massive. And there are charts that have actual comparisons, measure them all out, and it's huge. It's unlike anything that's ever been done before. So we know there's something future that isn't yet. So... That's one reason why we got to say, well, we got Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium here in Revelation 20. Yet we got Ezekiel 38 talks about Gog and Magog. And if we take a quick look at this, that's one issue we've got with Gog and Magog that's kind of makes you go, wait a minute, the timing there is. Is it really the same event? It probably can't be. But let's nail this down. Regardless of whether I bring something to you, or Greg brings something to you, or any teacher brings something like this to you, you know, you always listen advisedly. And I know Greg would say the same thing, and he has said the same thing. You be the Berean. You go and you explore and you find out being yourself. So that's what we're going to do a little bit here tonight, is dig in a little bit and say, okay, let's look at this and see if it's the same event or a different event. What is this with God and the God? Why is it so important, for instance, that Ezekiel devoted two chapters to it? So, Ezekiel 38, starting with verse 1, we'll just kind of read through some key passages here. Let's look at the first half a dozen verses. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal and prophesy against them, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, and put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Dagarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Okay, the first thing I want to do is, <clears throat> you've got a chart, a handy dandy chart here, with, it's blue, it's this crater right there, the one on top tells you the modern equivalent of these of these nations that it just named here, okay? So, um, conventional thought is Magog is Russia, and some people say, no. Nope. First thing I wanna say about these countries here is that really these are territories in Old Testament terms. In other words, the borders don't match exactly the same. You know, borders change all, just like here in the States, anywhere. 
So these are territories, these are regions, and there's some overlap. It's, it's kind of sloppy. Um, Rosh, a lot of people say because it sounds similar, will say uh, Russia. Now, and some other Bible teachers, one of them being J.D. Farag, will say no, because he's, J.D. Farag is uh, basically an, an Arab Christian pastor. He's Egyptian and Lebanese, and the language is very similar to Old Testament Hebrew. But Rosh is the same as what he says in, in Egyptian as, as Rus, which is, means head. So it's not necessarily the location. Uh, more and more people understand that that Rosh probably means the head. It could be the Antichrist, it's the leader, whoever's leading this coalition. So Rosh is probably the head. Um, although Russia is involved because Russia is included in the Gog, ancient Magog areas. So one way or another, Russia is involved. Persia, we know as Iran, really in real recent history, they changed their name, right? Uh, Meshach, Tubal, Tagarma is basically Turkey, but it, it slops over. It does go up toward, there's some overlap into um, near Moscow and Georgia, Armenia. Uh, Ethiopia, Kush, basically what it's talking about with Ethiopia is this north. North Africa, that whole area. Libya is up in there. Gomer is going to be more Germany and Poland and Czech Republic up in that region. Sheba and Dedan is, is uh, Saudi Arabia, basically. Um, Tarshish and her young lions, it's uncertain, but uh, a lot of Bible teachers will say that uh, Tarshish is the area that is more toward Great Britain in that area. So when it talks about Tarshish and her young lions in this passage in Ezekiel 38, and we'll, we'll get into there more, they'll raise a protest along with Sheba and Dedan. Um, they won't actually be involved in the war. So they're saying that could be like a Great Britain area. And her young lions, some people say, well, if Tarshish is Great Britain and young lions are raising a protest, that could be us in Australia and New Zealand and so forth, because we'd be the young lions of Tarshish, if Tarshish is the Great Britain, uh, Scotland, Ireland area. Uh, put or foot is Libya. So that's kind of the area that we see. And on a, on a map, I, I did scribble a spot here for you. This map here shows you how they're all coming in against, against Israel all these nations in Ezekiel 38. So, but one of the things I want to point out in here is the word of the Lord saying, Son of man, set your face against God, is that this is God's pronouncement in here. This is, this is him doing this. Look down at verse, verse 8. After many days, you will be visited in the latter years. So that's not something that's happened in the past. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So he's talking about Ezekiel 36 and 37, right? So it's all those people from the nations, and he's brought them back. And so the Lord in his judgment is bringing them in. But he says he's bringing them on the mountains. Now, one thing about that, and there's a chart in here that compares. Um, one of these handy dandy charts. Yeah, uh, it, it looks like this. It's kind of a black and white grayish chart. The top one there, um, the Gog and the God War versus Armageddon. And you see, that's a huge difference. Some of the people will say, well, the Gog and the God, that's Armageddon. Well, Armageddon's in the valley of Megiddo, right? Gog and Magog is in the mountains. That's a huge thing to me. So it was one of the things that, that um, Greg brought up last week when he was talking about Babylon and history of Babylon and some of the charts where you can look at similarities. But similarities can be found in lots of things. You know, like 
My face is similar to this piece of paper. It's not white. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we're the same. You know, so similarities are similarities, but they're not necessarily the, defined that they're the same thing. It's the differences that make the difference. So I think when you have one battle that's taking place in mountains and hills, and another place battle that's taking place in a valley, then they're two different, two different animals. So take a look at that chart when you get a chance. I'm not going to dwell on that too much because this one night Bible study thing would be a, and turn into a two night Bible study. Some of you might not mind that, but and underneath here, just for for some of you Bible geeks who really want to have some fun and dig in and you're interested in that kind of a thing, there are some teachers out there who compare Ezekiel 38-39 with Esther 9 in the, in the big battle that's mentioned there. And this chart here, if you want to get into the study and dig a little bit more, shows you how there are two different animals. Or you might hang on to this because someday you might run into somebody and says, oh no, but Ezekiel 38's already happened. That was in the book of Esther. Or if you run into that, you know, I've got a chart somewhere. So I threw it on there just as bonus because I had extra space to kill. So that was free. All right, so now we're getting nowhere. Any questions so far? I'm not going too fast, am I? Which version of the Bible are you? Right now, I'm reading the New King James. So. I thought King James, it doesn't have Rosh in it. Oh, okay. So I thought I was wondering where you got that. Because it just has that Meshach and Tabal. Mm hmm. But it doesn't have Rosh. New King James. Yeah. It might pop up later. I'm not sure whether they're the same or whether they're different. I've been spending a lot of time in, with the ESV, and I really like that version too. And I know there's some slight differences in there as well. Well, what I want to look at, what I want to point out and look at in here, and I want you to have in the back of your mind um, with some of this, is um, the timing, some things that might nail down the timing. You know, or you could stick a pin in it or whatever, or put a stake in the ground where some timing is. And. Um, uh, the leadership, who's who's in charge of the coalition. See, already here we have the Lord's leading Gog, but yet in the Gog and Magog war in Revelation 20, who's leading it? Satan, exactly. And you could say, well, you wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Satan is the guy who's behind, only he's kind of a puppet master. You could say that. So you could make a case for that. But let's keep let's keep reading and see if we're if we're there yet. But, um, you know, look at the locale and also the scope, the nations. Now, here's another difference that we're seeing already so far in Revelation 20. Who's involved in the Gog and Magog war there? Remember reading that? All nations, it's the whole world, right? Everybody. Well, here, Ezekiel 38, you've got some very specific nations. In fact, there's some nations not even mentioned. Like, where's Egypt and all this? Why aren't they involved? Um, yeah, why aren't they involved? Exactly. It's kind of surprising, but right now Egypt kind of still has a good relationship with with um, Israel. At this point in time, um, a couple years ago they did it for a brief period there, right? Remember that was kind of an Arab Spring thing going on over there. It was kind of scary. Um, all right. Anyway, let's let's keep going. Let's jump down when you get a chance. To read this whole thing, you should. You'd be well served to do it. Let's, let's jump down real quick to verse 11. Um, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. So here we've got no bars, gates, no walls, this kind of thing. But one of the things that, that some Bible teachers will point out and say, well, that's got to be way off in the future because Israel's got some walls right now. It's a big wall. So something's got to happen 
to where they're dwelling peacefully and they don't feel like they need any walls or anything like that. So some, we're still a ways off from the rapture or at least this event happening or any of this because Israel's got walls. And we've seen them on TV, right? I mean, in, as in some of these memes on Facebook and so forth, people will show, look at Israel's got walls, nice walls. You know, Donald Trump should get these. You know, this kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's what, I printed this up to show you an example how, how that ain't necessarily so. This little map here. I say no because ha ha. I had it blown up because it's too hard to see, but it's. <laughs> um, truth of the matter is, you hear a lot about Gaza and the West Bank, right? Those are places where the Palestinians have a lot of free reign, and it's where they dwell. Gaza and the West Bank. This dotted line around this area here and in Gaza, those are there with walls. Gaza. If an ally of the Palestinians were going to invade Israel, they're not worried about Gaza behind these walls. They're not worried about invading them, are they? They're already chummy with them. The same thing with the West Bank. Israel has no walls. Israel has like chain link fences, maybe some barbed wire here and there. I mean, a tank, a jeep, a Humvee, anything can roll right on through it. So, you know, if you have, for instance, right now you've got um, Gog and Magog, that coalition, rolling in, they're not worried about, I mean, they can just, right now we got, here's Syria, Syria where all the activity is happening right now, right? It's right here. They can just roll, motor right on in today. Um, there's a, let's see if I can bring this up. I don't know how close you um, you might watch the news or whatever, but uh, I like to watch what's going on in uh, some of the foreign newspapers and so forth because BBC. You know, I'll I'll, I'll look at um, you know Jerusalem Online and all that kind of stuff. Because, let's see if I can bring this up here. Here we go. Y'all ever see this picture? You know who those guys are? Putin, yeah. Erdogan, okay, from, from Turkey. And that's Rouhani from Iran. And they're all holding hands, all nice and chubby. That, my friend, is the triumvirate Gog and Magog coalition right there. And even 10 years ago, probably no way. But now this is them. Well, and that kind of support, supports your, you know, all these things are, are coming together. You know, it's like God knew what he was talking about here. However, it's a shelf life. Like, these aren't going to last forever. So once you start getting all these together and getting all these countries, like you said, connected and in their, you know, how it says here in the Bible that it's, it starts a TikTok. It's kind of like, can you imagine a situation where you would get ready to throw a party? You've, you've got all the food on the table, you've got the desserts, the party favors, whatever. You invite everybody over and they all come into one little place in Syria where the party is, and they'll decide, you know what? I'm not moving, I'm going home. And everybody leaves. Is that likely? So meanwhile, what's going on right now in Syria is you've got Russia over there and they're not going anywhere. You got Iran over there and they just I mean I just saw a head, headline of the day, I think it was in Ynet News, which is another Israeli news source, where Rouhani was saying that, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're, we're here to stay. Um, but what, what prompts this battle? What makes this happen? It says here in the passage that they Sheva and Dedan, um, 
you know, are asking the question, well, you know, why are you here? You, was well, they say here, they say, um, uh, you will say. So the Lord is telling Gog and Magog, he says, because I'm getting ahead of myself here, I'm sorry. He says, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages, and I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out uh, your hand against the waste places, etc., etc. So they're there to take a spoil. Um, it says in verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, and to take livestock and goods, and to take plunder? So in other words, they're going to protest and say, you know, are you here to, you know, pillage the place? Well, one of the things you can look at is, is Israel, it turns out, and off the shore of Israel, is now oil reserves and natural gas reserves that are found that it's even greater than Saudi Arabia. And guess who wants it? Everybody. Everybody wants it. But Russia, there's a reason why Russia is camped out here and Iran's camped out here. Because right over the border, you know, they would they really like this. Um, Netanyahu at one time sat down with Putin, and Putin wanted to try to negotiate some type of an oil trade deal or whatever, and that never happened. And I don't know what happened behind closed doors, the reason why that didn't work out. But um, Iran is not in a good place right now, financially or whatever, and neither is Russia is not in a good place with oil. So, so there's that. So it's interesting to watch, right? Uh, look down also. Um, well, we can look at. Uh, well, well, verse fourteen. Why not? Therefore, send a man prophesy and say to God, "This is the Lord God." On that day, when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, the Lord's saying here, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. This says the Lord God, you are he of whom I have spoken for former days, my servants, the prophets of Israel who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. So that's what they're asking is they're going to say, wow, Lord, did you do this? They're going to start recognizing their God of old. Now, there's something I want you to notice here that struck me in a, in a weird way several months ago that <clears throat> caused me to go run into all my commentaries and things, and they didn't find any comment on it at all. But it it kind of raised, uh, made a little light go off over my head about the timing of maybe some of this, and that is, that is this. Um, and it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy, and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake in my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains. I don't know if God is Putin or not, but it could be. If it were to happen today, that's who it would be. Um, says the Lord God, Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. Verse 23, Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know. I am the Lord. Wow, that's pretty dramatic. <laughs> that's a little bit different from the narrative we get in, in Revelation 20. So I think we see enough differences. But why would Revelation 20 be called Gog and Magog? 
And we see this pattern in Scripture. We've seen it before. In Daniel 9, it prophesied about uh, the abomination of desolation, right? And, and it ended up being fulfilled way into the future where it was Antiochus Epiphanes. He erected a statue of Zeus in the temple and he slaughtered a pig in the temple. And so he desecrated the temple of God. Then you get Jesus in Matthew 24, hundreds of years after Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's talking about the abomination of desolation as if it's still future. So many times, or most of the time in the Bible, when you've got Bible prophecy, there'll be a, a, a prophecy, then there'll be a near fulfillment, and then there'll be a later, on, later fulfillment, and sometimes even a, a third, um, but usually like a double fulfillment kind of a thing. And that's the case we see here. And it's the Lord does this and uses similar language to illustrate and to draw your attention to a certain aspect of something that is going to happen. It's like if uh, you know, if if uh, on on May fifth, a couple of airplanes go flying into a couple of towers in Los Angeles, okay, and take a couple of buildings out. People and news reporters and everybody are going to say, oh my goodness, it's, it's 911 all over again. Well, it's not 911 because it's May 5th. It's not New York, but it's Los Angeles. But what you're drawing attention to is, you know, the same type of event. So that's kind of the way we understand, we look at the similarities. So I think Gog and Magog is, yeah, we've got Satan, we've got Antichrist coming in. Here's the similarities. Um, the people of the world, Satan's people, turning against Israel. And that's what we have in Ezekiel 38. Revelation 20, Satan gets loose and he rounds up whatever unbelievers he can at the time because people going into the millennium are the believing survivors of the tribulation, right? Because the goats, the sheep and goats, they're judged. Only the sheep get to go in, but they have children. And we find this... Isaiah, in particular, second half of Isaiah, you'll find a lot of this type of thing where you have children and children playing in a viper pit and stuff, right? So you've got children, and that's so you've got mortals going into the millennium. They have children. You've got a thousand years. How many kids can people have in a thousand years, and especially if people are dying, you know? Um, and that's kind of what's described in Isaiah 2 about uh, this period during the millennium. So not all of those who are born in the millennium are going to be believers. Okay, now they're not going to be able to say the devil made me do it because the devil's bound, so there's not going to be any demonic forces or whatever, but a couple of things are going on during the millennium. One is God is demonstrating his grace because people are getting yet another chance to turn to him, right? There's another batch of people where God is going to expose himself to that Jesus will be on his throne. But this time we won't have the torment and the distraction of demonic forces and Satan and so forth. But um, so what is going to happen here is at the end of the thousand year reign, Satan gets loosed and he's going to round up some people, only it's going to be from the whole world. And the same thing, you're going to go against God's city and you're going to go against God himself and the throne of Christ, right? And then it says in Revelation 20 basically that they're going to be put down with the word. So it's not going to be, when we, when we get into Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, what we find is there's this long period of burial, nine months to bury the bodies. And if people see a body, they'll mark it off. So I, radioactivity, radioactivity um, or um, germ warfare or chemical warfare, you know, we're seeing even that, some of that now in Syria, right? So something's going to happen. It'll take seven months for them to be burying the body. The other thing is, it says is um, that they'll be burning the leftovers of the weapons for seven years, which is interesting. So I kind of, I personally have trouble believing that Israel will be burning contaminated weapons seven years into God's kingdom. Because I don't think they need the fuel. I don't think they need to keep warm. And contaminated weapons in Israel burning, burning I know it doesn't. What we find, though, in Revelation 20, though, is that fire comes down to heaven, consumes, it, consumes everything. 
wipes everybody out. So you'll have this seven years of looking for bodies, you'll have seven years of, or seven months, and you'll have seven years of weapons being rounded up and burned. You've got fire come down from heaven, boom, everything's gone. So the difference is, see, but now, what I want to point out of this passage, though, about God's wrath is this. Um, for one is, you know we, know, we know we live in the age of grace, right? The dispensation of grace. We live in the age of grace. Do we see, although we see judgment in the earth right now, in Israel is certainly living under some form of judgment a little bit right now, right? Because they're not walking with the Lord. We see God's judgment on the earth, but God's wrath on the earth, do we see God's wrath now? We don't, do we? We don't want to see. Um, first, first Thessalonians, let's, let's turn there real quick. There's a key verse, a key passage about the end times, right? First Thessalonians 4. Let's start with uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says to the saints of Thessalonica, uh, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, they've died, right? Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, right? It's a famous passage, remember that? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall be with the Lord Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning, chapter 5, verse 1, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they're saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pain comes upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So, this is a great passage for the rapture and to demonstrate that we're not going to go through the tribulation because it would be absurd for Paul to say, comfort one another with this. You don't need to worry about it. Don't worry about those times and seasons. What do you mean don't worry about it? I should be prepping, you know, or survivalist, you know. I should have a whole wall of ammo and guns and whatever, you know, food stocks and stores everywhere. And it's good to be prudent and have some of that. But full-on prepper, Paul saying, don't worry about it. You know, I don't have anything to worry about that. So if we're going to be going through the tribulation, like some people think, then that's kind of a, a crazy thing for Paul to say. But he says, um, we, we don't need to worry about it. It's not going to overtake us as a thief. It's going to come upon them. Even though they're saying peace and safety or peace and security. How often does peace and security, peace and safety, that phrase come up in Middle Eastern newscasts right now in the articles? It's, it's daily. And they're saying that now. So when this happens, sudden destruction will come upon them, not us. You are all sons of light in verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5, and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope and salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. A better word, probably in this passage here, he's talking to believers, right? So the word for salvation here, probably a better word would be deliverance, okay? To obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because they're already, they're already saved as far as their souls, right? So he's talking deliverance is the context. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, therefore comfort each other, and edify or build one another up, just as you're already doing. Okay, so wrath, he says, we're not appointed to wrath. Um, but yet, in Ezekiel 38, we have we have wrath. We have, we have a, 
if, if uh, you could put a note on your on your next to that passage there about not being pointed to wrath, you could put Revelation three ten in there. Revelation three ten to the faithful church. The Lord says, uh, "Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from what from the hour of trial, which shall come upon what." The whole world. So this is just your trial, Lord. So there's an hour of trial that's coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, as opposed to you who are not going to be dwelling on the earth, because he says I'm going to keep you from those things, right? So the wrath of God and the wrath of the time of testing kind of if we go back to this. Are y'all doing okay? Am I losing anybody or I know I'm kind of unloading a lot, and I'm trusting that you're going to go home and read Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, okay, so if we get the rapture here, this little period right in there would be the seven year tribulation period, right? Daniel's 70th week. And we're not there. This is where we get wrath, right? This is where we get the judgment of God. Just as Jesus said in Matthew 24, I'm not going to this course, but it's going to be like the days of Noah. The days of Noah is everybody's um, going about their business, life as usual, okay? And then sudden destruction type of a thing. And they didn't rise early. They mocked, they were busy mocking Noah and his family, the believers. And they get shot up in the ark. And they get delivered, and the rest of the world goes through judgment. So this is God's wrath. So that kind of tells me that I could be wrong, but the Gog and the Gog War, as far as the timing of it, it seems like it's going to be during the tribulation period because of wrath described here in Ezekiel chapter 38, starting with verse 19, about God pouring out his wrath and shaking the whole world and all that kind of stuff going on. Now, when in the tribulation, the tell for me is when you get into to chapter 39, when it says that in chapter 39, let's see, verse 9, it says that they're going to be burning weapons for seven years. That kind of tells me that it's either, either right at the beginning of the tribulation or, or, you know, one of the things we have to stop and look at is we don't know if there's a little bit of a gap between the rapture, and the seven-year tribulation. Because in Daniel 9, what kicks off, do you remember what kicks off the tribulation officially? The breaking of the treaty. The breaking of the treaty, right? Well, or no, no the uh, signing of an agreement. The breaking of the treaty happens in the middle of the world. But yes, you're on the right track, exactly. So, we could be raptured, some politicking, whatever goes on, or, or the Gog and Magog War. The Gog and Magog War, it might be a situation where it's an awful war and things get shaken and the whole world's rattled and, oh my goodness, how are we going to get through this kind of thing? It's a game changer with what God does. We read about all the wrath of God and the whole world's going to know. And then the Antichrist steps up and says, you know, I'm the Messiah. Here I am. You know, yes, we did that. And you might even say I did that, but I'm here now and I've come to bring peace. And Israel's always wanted their temple. And you guys want the temple now. And whatever. And so he might do some shenanigans and sign an agreement to get the temple um, built. And it might be days or a few weeks or whatever after that. And then you got seven years. So you got the seven year period there for Ezekiel 39 9 for the burning of weapons and using it as fuel. Now, I don't know what the, that the technology looks like. It seems like if anybody came up with that kind of technology to burn some kind of contaminated weapons where you can get heat off it and burn it, I mean, if they can do nuclear power plants, how they do things to burn weapons to make fuel out of it, it seems like Israel's probably got the tech to do something like that. But it just says in Revelation 39, that, I mean, in Ezekiel 39, that that's what they do. They, they burn the weapons for seven years and use it as fuel. And that's how long the tribulation week is, right? It's a week of years, seven years. 
So wrath plus this seven-year thing, that all kind of tells me that it's either right between the rapture and maybe the onset of the tribulation or right at the beginning. It's hard to tell. Like I said, I could be wrong. But now there's one of the things that could kick all this off, the, the whole Syria thing that you should keep an eye on. And, you know, I can't, it ain't gospel, as they say. Some of this stuff I'm saying, it's just something to watch. Because if you're excited and you love the Lord, you want to watch, right? Because because you love the Lord, it's like when you're little and you're, you're, you're waiting for grandma and grandpa to come over and you're at the front door, you're at the front window, right? Or you're waiting for dad to come home. Or, you know, you're... Your dad was in the service, and you're, he was deployed for a lot of years, and you know he's coming home sometime today. That little kid is up against the window like this, watching. If we really love the Lord. We're watching, and we're waiting. And because we, we know he's coming soon, we're listening to everything. So if, we're, if we love the Lord, we're really watching for him. We're going to keep an eye out for any of these types of signs. It says in 1 John 3 that he who has his hope purifies himself. So this, the end time stuff, this is the effect it should have on our lives, is purifying ourselves. You know, similar to Matthew 25, is that you're waiting for the master to come home. It's going to make you live holy. And that's what it should bring about in our lives is a holiness. Excitement, because we're going to be seeing this Lord soon, but also it should make us live holy lives. But one last thing I'll leave you with, and, and that is Isaiah 17, 1, the burden against Damascus. Damascus was attacked this last week. Um, at the major airport, right? Because Iran keeps shuttling in weapons into Syria and, and landing them at the Damascus airport. And Israel keeps saying, no, I ain't having it. And they keep bombing their Iran's installations at the Damascus airport. Here's the next, one of the next big events to, to watch for. Behold, Damascus will cease being, and it will be a ruinous heap. And, and uh, so Isaiah 17, 1 is something to keep an eye on. Damascus has always been there. It's one of the most ancient cities in the world. It's never stopped being a city, but something is going to happen very soon here in the last days that will make Damascus be a ruinous heap. So I don't know who's going to bomb the dickens out of them, if it's going to be Israel or or us, or Russia, or whatever, or if they're going to send it off themselves and blame Israel, or who knows you know, what that dynamic's going to look like. But something's going to happen to contaminate that city and so turn it into rubble that it won't be a city anymore. Kaput. So keep an eye on that. And that could be one of the things that makes Russia step, Russia step up and, and that whole coalition like the photo I showed you, and all their allies, and bring them up against Israel. It's either Israel will do it, or they'll blame Israel, it'll be Israel's fault, and it'll be what um, prompts them into going into Israel. Saying, you want their oil anyway. It's the hook in the jaw, it says in Ezekiel 38. So it'll draw them in. So questions about any of that? I know it was a lot, wasn't it? This chart here, as you're studying on your own, use, use this. this. You can compare... Um, like the first item on there, is God the driving force? In the Gog and Magog war, yeah, God is the one doing it. He's leading them in. In Armageddon, no, it's, you know, it's Antichrist or Satan behind it. In the last battle, no, it's not God. It's not the driving force. It is um, Satan. And then um, halfway down, where is this battle? Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38, it says that it's in the mountains of Israel. Armageddon, that's in Megiddo, it's in a, a valley. And um, in Revelation 20, it's, it's in Jerusalem on a broad plain. So, kind of look that over, go through it when you get a chance, and uh, hope you're blessed by it. But one of the things I, I would put a bug in your over, and I, I can't swear to it, but you know, these, these, we name these things like the Battle of Armageddon or the Gog and Magog War. But the Bible doesn't call them that. But we put, for reference, we put those titles on them. Revelation 6 starts the seal judgments, God's wrath, starts God's judgment on the earth. 
and the events. I got one chart in here. You'll see on one of these pages which one is on. I have buried it in my notes here. But one of these is a chart which compares Revelation 6. Oh, yeah. This orangey looking one. Um, Ezekiel 38 with Revelation 6. Revelation 6 to me, I, I put this chart on here because Revelation 6 looks like the aftermath of war. And some of the events really line up very similar. So I'm thinking the seal judgments. Uh, John's up there before the Lord. The Lamb of God opens up the seal, pours out his judgment, and it might, we know that. The Lord is in charge of what happens with Gog and Magog, and he pours the wrath out. So the seal judgments, what we see there, might be what we're looking at with the Gog and Magog war. Just a thought. We kick it all off. But, in the that set, unless you have any questions, or, because I know that was a lot. Yeah? Where did you find um, the passage that talks about um, burning the weapons for heat? Oh, in Jeremiah 39, 39. Because oh, okay. the Gog and the Gog War and all that happens in, in, in 39. Okay. Um, 39, verse 9 specifically. It's tricky that they would have to burn them for heat if there's so much oil. Yeah, I don't know if, if they have to or if that's their, their solution to get rid of all the contamination. Yeah. I mean, they could either bury it or if they would burn it, do something with it. You know, you can't just. Depending on what type of contamination it, it is, who knows? Yeah. You know. That's in 38 and 39. 39. 39. 39. 39. 39. 39. But that's talking about the war in the mountains. Oh, right. But they had, I mean, they really wouldn't use them all that way. Well, but they do, I mean, they do now, but I mean, yeah. you know, at this at this time when this when this happens, you know, like I said, I, Probably a lot of chariots and the horse the horses there. That they really didn't ride horses. They pulled. Well, back in their day, in the original no. chariots. No, but this is this is clearly it's clearly speaking of future events and why. Oh when, yeah, in, in the mountains, yeah. Right, and why exactly the uh, Ezekiel, or the Lord inspired Ezekiel to use ancient terms that he was familiar with, like horses and chariots. And arrows, it's what they're familiar with. Um, you see a, a great cloud, as the way it describes, coming upon the land. Well, when you see a bunch of tanks and people coming at you, you're, it's going to raise a similar kind of a cloud. Um, so you see missiles firing, you know, like they have a fire. It's going to look kind of like a rocket, like an arrow. A rocket's going to look kind of like an arrow. Who knows? But he's just kind of the poor guy is thousands of years ago, you know. And he's trying to describe the best he can something he's seeing in the future. And I mean, imagine how shocking all that is. And he's just trying to put it in the best terms he can. He talks about shields and bucklers. Well, bucklers is like armor. So everything's in armor. Everything's armor. Shields and bucklers. I can't describe. I don't know. Everything's. Looks like even the horses are wearing shields, but they're not horses. There's motors in it, but he don't know. He's looking at it going, what is that? You know, so it's. The, poor, poor Zeke was doing the best he could with what he was seeing, you know. I'm sure none of us could have done better than that. But any other questions about that? No, I hope that was good. Hope you hope you enjoyed it. But um, it's not real specific, um, directly real obvious necessarily in the Book of Revelation, even in chapter 20. But I wanted to highlight the difference and show that it might also be in Revelation in chapter six. It's just something I could be wrong, but. Study it for yourself and see what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.